Please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Kerala is trying to rebuild itself from the aftermath of what has been the worst floods that the state has witnessed in the last 100 years. And even as the centre, the state governments, NGOs focus on rehabilitating the lakhs of people who've lost their homes, we take a closer look at the culture of giving in India. There are numerous organisations that have stepped in and are trying to get relief to Kerala, number of individuals doing exactly the same thing. But outside of that, the question that we're trying to ask today is, what can we do to institutionalize a culture of giving? 2% CSR spend has been made mandatory for corporates, but are corporates really doing enough? Or is forced philanthropy dealing with its own constraints? Also, is it time to take the entrepreneurial route when it comes to the art of giving? Joining me today for this conversation, Sudha Murthy, Chairperson of the Infosys Foundation, Atul Satija, Founder and CEO of Nudge Foundation, uh, here with me. Uh, thanks very much for joining us, Mrs. Murthy. Let me start by asking you because uh, you and the Infosys Foundation are one of the organizations that have been at the forefront of uh, providing relief work in the aftermath of the Kerala floods. In fact, today, I believe, is the end of phase one uh, of, uh, of the relief work that you've started at the Infosys Foundation. Give me a sense, ma'am, of what you've been able to put together so far. Uh, thank you, Shireen. Uh, it has been a very hectic week for all of us. Uh, um, uh, we, we, we are probably used to working in uh, such relief for a long time. Infosys is 22 years old. Uh, foundation is 22 years old, and it may be 11th or 12th such uh, uh, relief work we are doing. So, uh, we by this time we know what exactly people need at this time. Uh, so we, we divide the entire work into three phases. Phase one, immediately what they want, survival kit we call. Phase two, welcome home kit, you know, kit we call. Phase three, where we would like to do something more than that. So we are in this phase one, and we work with the survival kits now. Okay, uh, you're in phase one, survival kits have been packed and are now being dispatched to Kerala. Uh, can you give me a sense of how you're partnering with state agencies, with government agencies to ensure that the relief material that you have been able to put together at the Infosys Foundation actually gets to the beneficiaries that require these most? Well, I observed one thing in the last 22 years. The first time when I started uh, um, relief work to this 11th or 12th, I can make out there a lot more giving. There are a lot more youngsters who would like to participate physically, yeah. economically, and also they would like to give some material. And I'm extremely happy and hopeful because next generation is more so generous. At Infosys Foundation, we have our own methodology, our own volunteers will join us, and we have a team of 20 to 22 people and we buy the material and we don't give it to any government agency or anything like you know uh, unknown party we have our own people in those areas for example uh, there is one uh, uh, swami japananda who is uh, uh, doing a human service in pavagada and who always helps us in such rehabilitation or survival kit distribution so we give it to him and mm -hmm. he takes personally mm -hmm. with his volunteers, stays in a place and distributes. Similarly, there are many organizations whom we know okay. for the last so many years we are working with them. So we, we directly give it to them and they mm -hmm. will distribute and we will have the list what they okay. have done with the photographs. So it's so sure, you know, when we give material, it reaches people. I'll give an example. We sent our first truck about two days back. Very, uh, that truck reached in the night. Next day morning, they distributed. Next day afternoon, I get a call from the receiver saying that today he had a good meal uh, because we, we give rice, dal, etc. And he cried on the telephone. That means within 13, 14 hours, the material will reach and people uh, use them. That is the greatest joy we have. 
Absolutely. It certainly is uh, heartwarming, uh, ma'am, to hear that. Uh, but let me take that across now to Atul Satija, uh, founder of the Nudge Foundation. Uh, Atul, several important uh, uh, comments coming in there from Mrs. Murthy. One, I think, underscoring the importance of how do you actually try and reach out to people at a time like this. The benefits of, uh, of uh, apportioning things like survival kits and then, of course, looking at what needs to be done after the immediate crisis is passed, etc. And the second issue is of accountability, of getting partners in place to ensure that the relief material actually reaches the uh, beneficiaries. You've just returned from uh, Kerala. Uh, what's been the experience on the ground for you, Atul? Yeah. So, Shireen, uh, thanks well, for having me, first of all. experience. Uh, for example... Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'll just come back to you, Mrs. Murthy, in just a second. Yeah. yeah. So, I think the first and the most important thing is, I right. think also alluded to that, which is you first find somebody that you really trust, and usually trust either comes from somebody else having worked with them and you know their work, or you first and have worked with that organization before. Uh, so, for us at Give India, for example, we work with uh, Goonj very, very closely. Uh, Goonj is one of the most respected, and they've done a lot of work in disaster mm -hmm. across the country over the years. So it is very easy for us to like pick a partner yes. that we have known over the years, does a great work, and actually support them of their uh, work on the ground, uh, which takes care of the trust part of it, right? Which we know that we are spending money, and the money is actually going to the right people on the ground. The second question is accountability and efficiency. Mm. And I think in these times, it is very difficult to be very sure of the efficiency of the spend, spend that is going, right? Uh, you're sending material to a relief camp. It's very tough right. to know when you're sending them, for example, medicine supplies, whether they need 100% of them or 40% of them. And I think usually donors understand that and are okay with that when the relief supplies are reaching somebody, uh, mm. they hope and mm. they wish everybody is, everything is used. But there is a certain inefficiency at these times that we have to factor in as givers when we give. That's one. And I think sure. people have that understanding mm. and forgivenessness, largely in the cases like disaster. Uh, on the ground, when you look at it, I think one of the things that I noticed uh, is that it is probably one of the largest scale uh, people collaboration project that we have seen in India in a very long time. Uh, we have seen organizations who are mm -hmm. uh, voluntary groups, not even legal organizations. We have seen people who are working across various non-profits, whether it's an orphanage, whether it's an animal rescue group, whether it's a humanitarian organization, whether that's a disaster mm. response organization. We have seen corporates on the ground. We have seen their trucks. We have seen celebrities come together. We have seen CEOs of very large organizations writing personal checks. We have seen lakhs of people as individuals coming forward and writing checks of various kinds. We have seen people with no money, uh, like all the fishermen, they're actually coming there in person and doing mm. volunteering there as well. So I think we need to acknowledge the level mm -hmm. of effort that has gone in from everybody across the country to put the effort that's happening on the ground for all the relief work, uh, and initially, obviously, the rescue work. And government's role is a very large one in all of this in terms of not just aggregating resources, but also channeling them on the ground, uh, creating information repository of where the need is, right. uh, channelizing sort of their people. And that's been really, really amazing for us uh, as we start on the ground. Mm -hmm. Well, that certainly is good news. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, the social sector, government organizations, individuals, corporates working together, that is the experience that Atul Satija and his team at Give India uh, have uh, seen on ground in Kerala. But if I could uh, uh, pick up on the point that you raised, Atul, because you brought up Goonj, one of your partner organizations, and you're absolutely right, Goonj, uh, like the Infosys Foundation, has been doing this for many, many years in India. And, you know, Anshu Gupta, I remember in, in a conversation that I had with him always speaks about the importance of dignity along with charity. So give with dignity is something that Anshu has always spoken to me about. And I want to uh, come to you, Mrs. Murthy, on that issue. Uh, you know, while issues like accountability and efficiency, etc., as Atul pointed out, uh, in the first few days of rescue and relief, those are issues that donors uh, will probably ignore. But what about the issue of sensitivity, of empathy, of dignity? How do you ensure that we create a culture of giving along with a culture of giving with dignity. Yeah, because I I, I believe in it, and it has been 
prune over a period of time and our Kathopanishad says you, giving is very important but giving with a grace, accepting with a grace and not making the person who receives is a mean and the person who gives is a great person. That is nothing like that. It says, our ancestors have taught us that one, dhanam priyavak sahitam, shraddhahi dhanam, ashraddhahi na dhanam. Person who gives should always thank the person who receives. You gave me an opportunity to serve you. Person who receives should not feel less about himself. He should say, look, I have got this one from you and uh, when time comes, I will give away to many more people because the giving culture and accepting with grace and giving to someone else, this is a, like a perennial source and it's a continuity. So we should not make it something, oh, I gave, I gave. Mm. No, I don't believe. And uh, dignity is very important. You know, it, it's like you know, in a family, you give somebody without even feeling hurt. And you should enjoy giving. Most importantly, you have to enjoy giving. And that makes other person happy. Not some, okay, take away, take this and get away, useless fellow and all, not that way. Take this and may you prosper. Take this and may you prosper. Give me an opportunity to serve yes. you when you are in difficulty. That attitude makes the whole exercise very beautiful and heart touching and cordial. Absolutely, it certainly does. But Atul, you know, the point that Mrs. Murthy was making on how she sees the youth actually participating and coming forward in large numbers, and that's what we've seen not just in Kerala, but in previous instances as well. Uh, what's your experience, and how do you believe we can actually get the youth, the millennials, to engage when it comes to creating this ecosystem of giving? Yeah. So, Shirid, historically, we've always connected. There is obviously a certain correlation of giving with age, right? As people sort of grow, they start looking at money differently, life differently. And we have seen sort of, uh, you know, people at the age bracket of 35 to 40 and beyond have given traditionally more. Uh, and we have the data from the Give India sort of uh, history of uh, doing work in India over the last 19 years uh, also have seen that. Increasingly, what is happening, though, is that most of the kids graduating from colleges now, all of them actually are post-liberalization kids, right? They have seen an optimistic, uh, a fast-growing India. And their ability and comfort to take a punt on their careers, on, on time, on money, is much, much higher than the people of, uh, you know, the previous generation. In fact, people who also graduated 10 years back did not have that confidence uh, and the room to do that. So that's one very important point that we are seeing manifest in the amount of talent that is looking to come and serve in the social sector, both in terms of money as well as volunteering, but also as a regular careers in the development sector. Well, that trend is visible. However, I hmm. think at, as Sudha also mentioned, I think there is a lot of work in terms of building higher sensitivity and awareness of how giving needs to happen that hmm. we have to do across all age groups, not just youth. And uh, I think, uh, the level of mm. energy that youth is coming out today with, it is largely manifested through volunteering and uh, uh, serving in the sector. But I think giving is something that they are in a very, very early stages of. And it's a good timing for us to work with them to build that sort of culture of giving at scale. I think the other important thing to also highlight is mm. that in uh, India in particular, giving has been very closely associated with uh, religion because giving historically was linked to religion and I think mm -hmm. there is a lot of data globally that shows that uh, as people uh, slowly sort of uh, uh, start having a broader perspective migrate more experience life and sort of geographies more they start looking at giving as an act in itself not linked to religion necessarily and that's a very healthy thing because then that money also mm -hmm. comes with a lot of questions on accountability which as a donor you may want, but as a religious fanatic you may not uh, really care about, right? The act of giving to religion is an end in itself, mm. but when you give money, you also want to see good work happen. Sure. And the younger generation today is bothered about that a lot more, which is a very healthy sign to see impact on the ground happen. Okay. Well, the important points that you're raising there, of course, this disassociation of giving, uh, which was previously linked to religion, continues perhaps majority to be linked to religion. But you're saying that there is a change in the way that uh, the youth is now spending and also the, the fact that they're perhaps 
a lot more uh, risk taking as opposed to risk averse also means that they are actively participating in volunteering uh, and getting engaged with the communities. But Mrs. Murthy, uh, you know, one of the important issues that perhaps holds this sector back uh, when we talk about creating this ecosystem of giving is the trust deficit. Uh, the government doesn't necessarily trust the social sector. The social sector uh, perhaps doesn't really have enough of a collaborative framework with organizations doing exactly the same sort of work. What can be done to encourage a more trust between government and the social sector and within the social sector itself? Transparency. I feel transparency leads to trust. When and sensitivity, sensitivity, transparency, and passion. If you know your counterpart also has, then the trust develops. And I have worked with many people, and I have worked on the ground for many years. I myself used to stay there in such uh, calamities. You know, go there and all. Now, what is most important is it is not the money, it is not the material. You have to give your time. You have to give your time, and the time. When somebody gives time, they realize how hard it is to procure a material, carry it, give it to people, see the difficulties. It requires a lot of time. It makes you very mature. Actually, you understand what is life. Life is not only money. Life is not only achievement. Life is not only beauty. Life is much more than that. A great compassion comes out of all these experiences. Then you, whatever happens, you say, oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So. Unless there is a, you, with a partner who you want to work, they should have transparency uh, in, in transactions. What money we have given, how they have spent, what is the overhead, who are the receivers. And the person who receives should not be your relative. Mm. It's a trust, it's a, it's a great rule which you have set up at Infosys Foundation. No religion, no language, no political party are important to us. They are in need of help and we, are a, we can help with our infrastructure, we should do. This kind of an attitude with a detachment, without mm. expecting anything from the receiver, and it's not like I scratch your back and you scratch mine. Absolutely nothing. If we don't help such mm. people mm. at this time, they will perish. With this compassion, then only you can have a great partners. Who have similar ideology, then only you can mm -hmm. have great partners. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Transparency is the key to being uh, able to bring in more accountability. But Atul, before I take a break, I want to ask you about how can we bring some of these efforts to scale? Because there are several organizations who might be doing exactly the same thing. And my, not each of these organizations will have the capacity, the bandwidth to be able to take this to scale. The problem in India is one of the lack of scale. How do we bring in scale as far as the social sector is concerned? Yeah, so Shireen, uh, there's a question very, very Shireen, close to my heart. Uh, sorry. So I think uh, it's a very pertinent question. Uh, the way Go I ahead, like Dr. to put it is that, you know, if India's best engineers, doctors, lawyers, artists, journalists, if all of them don't come out graduating from colleges wanting to solve India's most meaningful problems, and they are trying to solve India's most lucrative problems, you will not see the large scale problem solving that we need to see to build a society we all want. So it's very important for us to associate a sense of uh, pride and meaningfulness in good work that exists. But I don't think we talk about that enough. So to me, I think the starting point of scalable problem solving is the best talent of the country coming in looking at solving these problems. And that's not happening right now at scale, right? There are amazing mm. number of super mm. awesome people in the sector. But our best talent is not graduating from all sorts of colleges yeah. or looking at mid-career sort of shift into the development sector and actually solve the problem. There are many uh, Czech writers, uh, foundations, philanthropies, CSR guys uh, in the corporate world. Mm. But within mm. the development sector, we can easily make do with 1,000 times better talent than we have and 1,000 times more talent than we have. So that's one thing that's very important mm. for us to create mm. a sense of pride with the sector. Now, my appeal to all the uh, check writing entities, so to say, is that we need to create capacity of the nonprofit sector to be able to afford this talent. 
not pay premium for yeah. good work, which is too much to ask right now, mm. but at least not expect a massive discount to do good work. And I think that narrative has to change, which it hasn't changed so mm. far, right? And I think with CSR money, we have seen many organizations being very comfortable taking risk, accepting talent, uh, even being okay with the paying them meaningful mm. salaries for them to be in the sector and stay. I think that's one narrative that we need to build, which is mm. missing right now at scale. The second thing is that we also need to change the conversation when we discuss nonprofits from their character to capability, right? Obviously, there, is, there are a lot of nonprofits right. uh, which may not be clean. We can question their work. We question how they work, their efficiency. But there is a very large mm. number of nonprofits that are really credible, doing amazing work, and have good talent. But even they are colored with the same sort of uh, stroke of uh, brush by saying that, you know, prove your mm. character first before mm. we talk about your capability. So I think uh, generally a narrative of top talent and a narrative of sort of capability of a non-profit, right. right? The conversation needs to change to what can you do? Can you scale? Mm. Do you have systems, quality? Uh, are you taking risk? Are you innovating? How will you look at it? Put a quality lab, put an innovation lab. There are yeah. no job portals. There are no incubators, yeah. there are no accelerators, there are no seed funding. So the whole infrastructure of the sector needs mm. to be built. Mm. Uh, and I think that is starting to happen with CSRs and foundations starting to see things differently now. Okay, great. Uh, on that note, we'll take a break and when we return, I will get Sudha Murthy to respond to the comments that came in from Atul Sutija on how we can build scale as well as capability in the non-profit or the development sector. That and more. And we'll talk about uh, crowdsourcing and online funding with Keto. That's coming up for you after this very short break. Well, as Kerala tries to rebuild itself, we discuss the culture of giving in India. Let me go back across to Sudha Murthy. Uh, Mrs. Murthy, you know, the point that uh, Atul was making before we went to a break uh, on creating capability, on creating scale within the development sector, how do you ensure that there is a narrative change, that we bring in an entrepreneurial culture into the non-profit or the development sector to ensure that we can actually deliver to scale? Maybe because my background helped me a lot. I worked with Tatas, and uh, Tatas were entrepreneurs as well as uh, compassionate people. And, uh, you know, if you are a bent of mind, uh, this kind of uh, work in an organization like this can make you be aware of say, or to be sensitive to some other's problem. And a little bit of philosophical way of looking at life helped me a lot. And I work in so many other states. Um, and every state has its own problem. It is not, you know, what is happening in Kerala. Suppose there is a drought in North Karnataka, it will not be the same way. So these, all these experiences made me to think more about compassion and it can be easily reached to people by example. Any theory you can talk, but practically you can introduce, influence people only by example. And lead by example, uh, and the next generation is very eager to accept these kind of a situation, this kind of a learning. But compassion mm. is very, very essential quality of all these activity. That is little bit of thinking about life, little bit from your parents, something you should uh, get from every corner of life that makes you to think on all these lines that it is our country to help our people. And after all, money is not the only way uh, or the only uh, thing we have to earn in life. All this, mm. it's not a one line answer. The today's yes. uh, philanthropy has many components. One is liberal thinking, good education, family planning, we have hardly one or two children. Uh, and then a, ta a great talent, mm. uh, talented people get an opportunity which was not there many years back. And, uh, and of course, post liberalization mm. of uh, you know, influence, all those things have helped to form a better, better way of thinking in philanthropy. That's what I feel. 
Absolutely. Let me then take that question across to Zahir Edenwala, the co-founder of Keto, a crowdsourcing platform. Zahir, thanks very much for joining us uh, on the program. Uh, what's the latest count? Because I know that Keto has been trying to raise funds for Kerala through your partner organizations as well. Uh, what's the latest? Um, hi, I'm sorry I didn't hear the whole question, but I heard the last bit that talks about the latest count. Uh, we are currently somewhere close to about 1.5 crore rupees that we've raised for Kerala over the past five days. Um, just a quick breakup also of the funds that we are raising. We are currently working with over 40 non-profit organizations in India who are raising money for the Kerala flood situation. And we are also working with close to 150 individuals who are taking up matters in their own hand and raising money on Keto to further impact, create an impact on ground and help the people who have been displaced so far. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, that's great. 1.5 crores raised on the Keto platform so far. Zaheer, my question to you is, uh, what has been the experience on Keto so far? What are the insights of the kind of money that individuals, donors seem to be sending, not just to Kerala, but for other uh, disaster-related relief measures as well, other uh, unfortunate events as well? And, you know, what is the age group? What are the insights that you're getting from the way that people are spending on the platform? And how can we encourage more? Sure. So uh, to take the age group question, we've, uh, we have a huge support from the millennials. Uh, the majority of our donors are lie in the category of 25 to 34 years of age. Um, obviously, there are a huge, huge donor base again from 18 to 24. But, uh, you know, since they are young people and I'm not sure how much disposable income they have to make donations, their donation sizes are a lot smaller. But working individuals and business owners in India, especially from corporate India, I've been really, really helpful in our journey so far and have been, uh, have come forward every time we've had a case or a cause that we needed funding for. Uh, to answer your second question, Shreen, uh, regarding the impact that we've been able to create, um, if I had to just take a quick step back, Keto functions in two, two manners. Uh, the first of all, Keto works with non-profit organizations to help them effectively fundraise and raise money uh, for their activities that they do on the ground. And secondly, Keto is also working with a lot of individuals um, who are looking to help one another, uh, be it part of their family or be it a colleague at a workplace. And Keto is directly working with these individuals and mm -hmm. helping them raise money. So the impact that we have created in a nutshell, uh, the bigger causes that we cater to are in the medical space and in the education space. Uh, we are currently uh, helping more than 150 patients from various uh, places in India who are helping us raise money. Sorry, there is a technical issue over here. Just give us one second. Sure. Sure, sure. Let me uh, go back across. Uh, let me go back across to our other guests. Uh, and and uh, Mrs. Muthi, let me start by asking you, and I'll get wrap up comments from each of you. Uh, you know, priority areas that you believe we now need to focus on to ensure that the momentum that has been built, this culture of giving, this ecosystem that has been created, uh, only grows from here on. The priority areas that we need to focus on. I didn't get the question properly, Shireen. No, I was just asking you, what are the areas of priority or focus Hello? that we should now concentrate on, uh, not just related to Kerala, but to ensure that we continue to build momentum around this culture of giving? Yeah. Um, you should share your experience. I felt it, I could do it uh, because I worked on the ground level for a long time. So whenever the people call me to deliver a lecture or something, I always share my experience. And there, there are the true experience. Like, you know, I have seen in some areas, um, which I never thought, when there was a, a flood, uh, I, I could see many parents uh, leaving their polio sick, uh, children. And I was so surprised. I said, how can it be possible? But it was possible. And I wish to take those children and put them in an orphanage and their parents will come and claim them maybe after three, four days. Because I used to get so upset when I was young, but I realized why they do. So you, when you go, you are on the ground level, you will come across so many things which you should share with people. And I write about it. 
and that's the reason when people read that they realize they reflect a different life you know you may be having a lot of money but one fine day a small earthquake and you know take you a common man life is fragile unpredictable and you share that with people after that you think it over it is not by force fortunately in the infosys foundation case we don't have to seek donations infosys management is kind enough to give us money so we can we convert every moment minute of our work into into talking to people ta talking our experience and understanding what people really need at that hour either it's a kerala or orissa or madhya pradesh wherever it is so sharing your experience to the larger extent particularly in college level i share with the students and that is the reason i i think young, youngsters are more influenced by not by reading more by listening to all these real life talks hmm okay so share your experience uh, that's the word in from sudha murthy uh, atul i'll give you the final say focus areas priority areas yeah so shireen uh, i think what has happened over the last uh, sort of uh, phase is most of the people have given money for uh, uh, largely the rescue and the relief phase and i think what we are doing what we are entering into now is the rehab phase which is where we need to figure out a way to have giving continue in a committed fashion over time so far we have raised about uh, as give india working with partners like go on the ground we have raised about 2 2 and a half crores across the retail so 9000 donors have come forward uh, and given small amounts of money and there are 1500 people more than 1500 people donning the campaigns on give india supporting the ngos on the ground but i think in the next phase what we will be doing is we will be looking to launch rebuild kerala campaigns where we want to invite people to actually make their giving not just one time but more sustained so that the work on the ground can happen in the rehab phase which is the most difficult phase for the families when they go from relief camps back to their uh, you know houses and start cleaning and rebuilding their lives going back to work and things like that so i think my appeal to everyone is to kind of think about how you will be supporting because the work has just gotten started it is not over yet so how will we bring the collective yeah. energy that yeah. we saw in rescue and relief moving into rehab and sign up to be committed mm. givers uh, to rebuild camp okay, catalog okay so focus on Absolutely. So the uh, efforts now on rehabilitation are here I'll end by asking you uh, priority areas that we need to focus on from here on Sorry, can you please repeat that question? I'm in a really bad area right now. Uh, priority areas uh, uh, that we need to focus on, Zaheer. Yes, so I completely agree with Atul. Um, the only the slight difference that we've seen on our platform is a lot of people have come forward and supported cause related to food supplies and immediate amenities that were required. But a sustained effort will be required from all donors in India because. uh i think this is just the first part of the problem the bigger picture of rehabilitation starts now and we need more and more people coming forward and helping us in achieving our goals of restoring lives in kerala absolutely and that is what we must focus our attention on you can go on to keto or uh, give india and of course there are many other organizations uh, in the social sector corporate foundations like the infosys foundation that are working on relief as well as rehabilitation for now sudha murthy atul satija and zahir edenwala appreciate you joining us here on cnbc tv 18 to talk about the road ahead for the art of giving and creating a culture and ecosystem of sustainable giving in india appreciate your time thanks very much for joining us